Welcome to this week's podcast with Dr. Julie Holland, a psychiatrist specializing in psychopharmacology and author of the recently released book, Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. Tune in as we talk connection through chemistry, how psychedelics activate your parasympathetic state. Welcome to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here to bring you cutting edge interviews with leading scientists, entrepreneurs, and medical professionals who are exploring how we can integrate psychedelics in an intentional and responsible way for both healing and transformation. It is my honor and privilege to bring you these episodes as you get deeper and deeper into why these medicines are so critical to the future of humanity. So let's go and let's see what we can explore and learn together in this incredibly important time. Third Way Podcast is brought to you by Magic Mind. Do you want more creativity, flow, and energy in your day-to-day routine? Then go to magicmind.co and get the two-ounce shot that contains 12 magical ingredients scientifically designed to improve your product. I've been using Magic Mind over the last couple months. It has replaced my morning coffee. It has matcha, lion's mane, and a number of other nootropics, and I can't say enough about it. It is so, so useful. So if you're interested in Magic Mind, go to magicmind.co and enter promo code THIRDWAVE to get 10% off and try it for yourself. As longtime listeners know, yoga and meditation have played a huge role as complementary practices to my own responsible psychedelic use. And that's why we're excited to be working with Half Moon Yoga as a partner for the podcast. They carry everything from basic yoga supplies to more advanced things like bolsters and sandbags to meditation cushions that are super comfy to sit on. And right now they're offering a 15% discount to third wave listeners with the promo code Third wave. I'd encourage you to check them out at shophalfmoon.ca if you're looking for tools to support your yoga or meditation practice. Hey listeners, and welcome back to the Third Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, here with Dr. Julie Holland. I first met Dr. Holland in person not all that long ago, I think at Horizons this past October in New York City. We had a chance to talk for 10 or 15 minutes at one of the pre parties. And, you know, our topic was a little sensitive. We had exchanged emails earlier that year in light of some of the controversy that Third Way went through in hosting the event. And, you know, Julie was incredibly supportive and, you know, just, just supportive of the work that we had done at third wave and, you know, everything that had been going on. And of course I knew and had known about Julie for some time, you know, ever since I entered the psychedelic space four to five years ago. So to finally have an opportunity to interview her was incredible, you know, something that she has a lot of expertise in are two topics that I think are going to be super relevant to our audience. The first is the relationship between microdosing psychedelics and psychiatric medications, in particular antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. As a psychiatrist, she works with a lot of clients who are on medications and looking to either transition fully off them or to reduce them through psychedelic medicines. So we talk quite a bit about that process in the podcast episode. And we also talk a lot about neurochemicals like oxytocin and serotonin and dopamine because Dr. Holland just published a book called Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And so I really wanted to highlight some of that best content in our episode today. So we're going to talk about connection and activating the parasympathetic system and how psychedelics can help us to spend more time in a rest and digest perspective. We also bring in cannabis a little bit uh, as Julie has also written a fantastic book about weed. So, I mean, this is just a fucking awesome episode. Julie is a wealth of wisdom and knowledge as it relates to psychiatry and psychedelic medicine. And I'm just so excited for you all to tune in today. So without further ado, I bring you Dr. Julie Holland. I hear some lovely birds where you are. That's delightful. I'm in a garden. I, I'm at an Airbnb in Miami. I came here for COVID to nice to wait it out because I was in an apartment by myself in Oakland and I was like, I'm either in the city in Oakland by myself or I get a place with a friend and we have a big garden and a hammock and yeah. I'm like, I'll do this, I'll do this podcast outside. It's a it's nice here. That's so, a really good idea. How's your situation? I, I see you you've gotten a lot of family time music recording in on, on Facebook. Yeah. My- like for <laughs> for sure, um, 
we have been playing a lot of music. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, you know, when this first started, I really found myself like almost every day, uh, playing my guitar and singing and crying and singing and playing. And, um, mm. and I recorded this Led Zeppelin song going to California because it's about a girl who plays guitar and cries and sings, which is like pretty much all I was doing. Uh, not all, but mm. like at some point, you know, I've, uh, music is a great cathartic release for a lot of people, mm -hmm. me included. And, you know, yes, we like to do it with a lot of other people around and it's great to dance, whatever, but like, it still works if it's just you, you know, and it's like, it's an easy way to open my heart. And I'm just trying to sort of let, let things go through me and not get stuck in my body energetically yeah, it's just, yeah you know it's a lot to take in and uh all, many of us and many probably many people who are listening right now would consider themselves to be empaths or you know sensitive people you know i think it sort of goes with the psychonaut territory for whatever reason we think a lot we think a lot we feel a lot so it's obviously it's a lot to take in you know in conversations that i've had with various people this is sort of like the initiation if you will that a lot of people have been anticipating from, you know, medicalization of psychedelics or mainstream use of psychedelics. And, you know, it wasn't a MDMA or psilocybin assisted psychotherapy that did it. It was a virus because it's getting everyone to sort of go inwards and yeah. maybe reflect a little bit. Um, yeah. There's so, there are so many great metaphors for what's happening now. And the, and the one that I keep talking about that really, really works for me um, is this sort of, sort of like the very hungry caterpillar where we were in this phase of consumption taking in and destroying now we are in this sort of intermission cocoon phase and then the uh, the huge question that everybody has is like what are we going to be like on the other side of this and you know is this going to be wasted will things be different will we build everything from the ground up again great questions <laughs> you know what the fuck am i now i mean i you know i have yeah. my, i have my hopes and dreams <laughs> i have my you know dark my deep dark uh, fears you know it's like it's so easy to to project yourself into the future and you can either um, envision a hellscape or, you know, rainbows and unicorns. It's seeming to me it'll be maybe a both <laughs> yeah. and situation, you know, like there will both be the hellscapes of, you know, I've been watching people talk about like a Hunger Games yeah. like society where you have the ultra wealthy and then, you know, basically everyone else who's just getting energy extracted from them. But then also a lot of People in my community and people I know are, you know, they're buying land in Costa Rica and setting up intentional communities and, you know, really looking at what's beyond just, you know, capitalist, industrialist, yeah. urbanized society. Well, I certainly love the idea of intentional communities. We we ended up creating an unintentional community where we live. Like, uh, we really <laughs> found our people. Um, and, you know, I live in a very small town north of New York City, but it's kind of like you go back in time as you take the train northward. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's more of a red state where I live, I would say, than, than, you know, the blue, the blue state of New York City. But we still have managed to sort of find our people and find a great community. And there's, there's a lot of resonance up here, actually, with like being near, you know, Woodstock or Millbrook or, you know, not that far from Cosm. And there's some very trippy farms all around uh, Western Connecticut, and Eastern New York. That has been really good for me. And when I see how our community comes together and, ha and how we support each other and, how, you know, we've created this multi-generational community that's sort of based on farmers and a little bit on psychedelics and a lot on music. Then I think like, oh, we're going to be fine. You know, we're going to, we're going to survive. But there's also like the, we could spend an hour talking about my, you know, fears of this president and his pathology and how that could potentially play out. I mean, yeah. it's going to be a very fucked up year. You know, I had this, yeah. uh, I tend to be very optimistic and yeah. I had this idea that 2020 was going to be like the year of clear vision. You know, it's clear seeing it's perfect vision 2020, you know, like this is going to be the year that we're just we're really going to get it. And everybody's going to finally see the light, you know, and like, maybe, maybe that is happening now that what I tell my patients about sort of worrying about the future is, you know, you may have fear or pain or terrible things, you know, or scary things happen to you in the future. But like, why have that pain and fear twice? You know, why not wait till the bad thing happens to feel mm. bad about it? Like, why not now pretend if you pretend everything's going to be great, then you get to have pleasure twice, you know? Or at least pleasure once. Mm. If things suck later, you can pretend they were going to be good now. So you know, I'm really try try to uh, figure out how how things are going to be good. 
but this one's this one's a little more challenging than the average. Yeah, it's tricky, it's and it keeps and it keeps changing. And, you know, and I'm a very much like when. Like, uh, you know, I plan out, you know, when I'm going to go to a conference and speak, you know, in six months or nine months. And uh, I love, you know, mm-hmm. knowing my calendar. Mm-hmm. And this is just like a big uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, unscripted, you know, a snow day is basically how I think of it. Like, you know, when the kids when the kids had no school and we had no plans because everything got canceled, it was a snow day. Right. And like so one snow day is great. But like, you know, a month of snow days, I'm going to lose my shit. I thought I really was going to lose my mind. But I'm not pretty much as far as I could tell. It is, you know, a lot of us are with our families. Like for instance, my daughter is coming from college to her childhood home. And that's, that can be Mm -hmm. very tricky. I remember being in that place where you think, you know, everything. uh, And yet now all of a sudden you're, you know, it's sort of treated as a child again. It's hard. That's how we're all being treated, you know, as, as children again. And it's not just the people coming back from college, but I even feel it and this is what it is. There's no judgment around the shelter in place and, you know, stay at home and house arrest and, you know, don't go near anyone. And it does feel a little bit obviously necessary to minimize the, the exponential risk and also a little bit of a nanny state in that the terms that are being dictated, you know, there's this general saying that like once a, a government take certain rights away, it's yeah. really difficult to get them back. And I think that that's a fear Definitely. that a lot of people I know. Have I will. In, first in of all, you know, we all know that Trump has just got like a huge heart on for these other dictators. Why wouldn't he want to be a dictator also? You know, like who does he really like chum up with? So yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of surprised he hasn't already made, you know, more of a grab, but also that, you know, there are so many things happening while we're focusing on the virus, like, you know, rolling back the EPA and they're still like fucking the planet basically hard and getting rid of a lot of supervision. Like there's so much fuckery going on. There's so much opportunity for anger and frustration and, you know, explosion. And like, we're all kind of still taking it, you know, and it's really is everything sort of done by degrees, like with, like with an abusive lover or partner, you know, where it's just like, they're slowly turning the screws and nobody's done anything <laughs> no one's being like what like what can, the, can we the, stop can this get, can we just stop him yet like what the fuck right what the fuck well and yesterday you know we're recording this it's tuesday april 14 yesterday there were two big announcements you know within this vein which was essentially california washington and oregon yeah. announced a three-state pact to address right. coronavirus and donald trump made it clear in his press conference that he has total authority right. is, is a direct quote from him. So, um, you know, I think we are already yeah. seeing a potential secession in place and that when Trump becomes elected, which I think he will, I, I, I don't have much confidence in Joe Biden whatsoever, that he will likely continue to grab power in, in the wake of, of COVID. So we are yeah. in for an interesting ride. And I think what you... I, I don't no, want to spend too saying, much time like, on this. We could, we could easily it, it talk an hour about politics, but you know, but here's here's yeah, what exactly. I want to say, though. Maybe, and which will lead us back to okay. psychedelics is that um, sometimes when Perfect. people have a positive experience with psychedelics, at the peak of that positive experience is a sense of oneness and this sense that every everything is connected, that we are all connected, that, you know, it's all one thing. We're all on one planet hurtling through space. And there's often this sense of belonging and connection and that we're all in this together. And, you know, I can speak to the trees or I am one with the stars or, you know, and this is part of a mystical experience, right? The sense of oneness and that you don't really have a sense of where you end and something else begins because it's all connected. And for many people, that is a a blissful place to be in. And for some of us, we come away from that place and we sort of remember that lesson that, uh, you know, we share the planet and we're all on the same team and we're all connected and this kind of thing. But there's a certain style of government or a branch of government as opposed to, hey, we're all in this together is a little bit more like, fuck you, I got mine, you get yours, (laughs) let's say. You know, I don't have to worry about you and your. And it's like a psychopathy. So it's like a psychopathy. And this, I mean, you you can call it psychopathy. You can call it sociopathy. um, But but it is this sort of disregard for other people's needs or situation. And like I'm I'm going to do for me, um, or maybe me and mine, but not you and yours. And you know, this is why people keep talking about 
switching from me to we, you know, and that's really just <laughs> socialism to some degree, right? Is like, what do you need? What do I have? How can we share? How can we cooperate? You know, how can we make sure there's enough for everybody? And there's democratic socialism and there's socialism, but it's still this, this idea that we are all in this together and we need to share our resources. And then you have sort of capitalism or conservatism or just, you know, some sort of ultra right wing, which is, you know, no, you're on your own. I'm going to get my shit and here's my gun. And, you know, you, I'm not going to provide for you. And it's a really basic difference between parasympathetic and sympathetic. So sympathetic is something we all know about, right? That's fight or flight. And it's a very fearful, closed down state. Parasympathetic is the opposite of sympathetic. So it's the opposite of fight or flight. So that's when you're intend and befriend or connect and protect. It's where the body can um, digest. It's when the body repairs itself. It's when you can sleep. It's when you have sex. Although there's a little bit of sympathetic in sex, but mostly the parasympathetic state is what's better for your body. And that is an open state where you are open to learning, you are open to sharing, you're open to communicating and connecting. I have a book coming out in June where I talk a lot about this sort of open versus closed and parasympathetic versus sympathetic. And right now, you know, we've, we've been more and more in this fear-based fight or flight uh, I'm going to do for me and you're on your own. We, we've been in that way of thinking more and more. And, and, and you know, Trump is certainly more of like a, uh, I'm going to do what's good for me as opposed to I'm going to do what's good for everybody. Um, so I, I'm very lefty liberal and I care uh, deeply about other people and their needs. And, you know, that's the kind of work I've always done is, you know, really trying to give people what they need. You had brought this up at Horizons, you know, emphasize the the parasympathetic state, the rest and digest state, yeah. which to be honest is not that widely talked about in the psychedelic space. We hear a lot about the brain and neuroplasticity and the default mode network and healing trauma and things like this. But, you know, what I'd love for you to dig a little bit deeper into is like, what role do cannabis, because you've written a lot about cannabis and know a lot about cannabis, but also obviously psychedelics, how do these medicines help facilitate that parasympathetic state. Yeah. So this is the whole sort of message of, so I have a book coming out in June, it's called Good Chemistry. And the subtitle of Good Chemistry is The Science of Connection, comma, From Soul to Psychedelics. So it's about the science. It really is a whole book about the parasympathetic nervous system and about what it takes to be in para and how we're all spending way too much time in sympathetic. And it's really bad for your body. It's bad for your immune system. Your body can't repair itself when it's in fight or flight. You know, I have patients who like work and they're very stressed out at work and then they go to the gym and they run on the treadmill and then they get home and like they can't sleep. And it's just like, you know, at some point you have to switch gears and you have to get off your computer and stop thinking about work and stop, you know, people get like adrenaline fatigue, like we're adrenal fatigue, excuse me. Um, many of us are in fight or flight too much. And so the book is about how to get into parasympathetic and not, you know, I'm not saying that psychedelics will put you into parasympathetic because it's not that simple. But what I am saying is that there are various things that do put you in parasympathetic that leave you very open to feeling connected and in that we versus me state. And I would say that parasympathetic is all about connection and opening and bonding and trusting and going from, from me to we. Um, and so as much as adrenaline and cortisol are, are the chemicals that fuel the sympathetic nervous system, the thing that really fuels the parasympathetic nervous system is oxytocin. So the book is very much about oxytocin, which is a hormone of trust and bonding. Um, and you know, common examples of high oxytocin states are orgasm, nursing, childbirth, hugging, you know, even pats on the back or pats on the butt if you're an athlete. This sense of like, I got your back, I'm on your team, you know, we belong together. And like, you know, good handshakes, eye contact, any of that. There's this sense of, you know, I can trust you. We can cooperate. We are on the same team. You know, we're social primates and we are really hardwired and designed to connect and to cooperate. And oxytocin is what is the sort of the lubrication for all this social bonding behavior that happens. And there are certain drugs that also really markedly increase oxytocin. And the MDMA, which is a long-standing favorite of mine, my very first book is about MDMA. It was called Ecstasy, The Complete Guide. 
um, a comprehensive look at the risks and benefits of MDMA. And that uh, was out in 2001, right at 9-11, actually. I had, I had my big book publicity push on um, 9-10. So, uh, wow, good timing. <laughs> yeah, it was fine. Um, it, all, it all works out eventually. So MDMA increases oxytocin. And it turns out that at the peak of psychedelic experiences, which, you know, we all know about 5-HT2A, right? Psychedelics are, you know, they're agonists for the 5-HT2A receptor. So that's the, the receptor that they sort of tickle. But they also tickle other receptors like 1A and I believe either 2C or 1C. I will tell you later on. <laughs> the thing I learned a year ago is that the 5-HT2A receptor actually creates a dimer, which is a receptor pair with another receptor, which is the oxytocin receptor. And there ends up being crosstalk between these two systems, between the serotonergic system and the oxytocinergic system or the oxytocin receptor. So, and in good chemistry, I talk about this particular dimerization because I was really floored to learn about it, but it made sense to me because I kept, you know, I know that there's a sense of oneness and connection and trust and bonding that happens with, with MDMA, but it also happens with the classical psychedelics. And so how is that? You know, nobody ever talks about like LSD increases oxytocin or psilocybin. I mean, believe me, I looked, I couldn't find anything at all, but then I did finally learn about this dimerization of the receptor, which means that there's crosstalk. So indirectly, psychedelics do stimulate the oxytocin receptor. So that was really interesting, maybe more to me than uh, other people who read this stuff or are listening to me now, but I was really excited about that, learning that. So is cannabis a psychedelic then? So, oh, so to then here's definition? the other thing, is that the cannabis, the CB1 receptor dimeriz dimerizes with 5-HT2A. So high-dose THC stimulates the 5-HT2A receptor because there's dimerization and there's crosstalk between the cannabinoid receptors and the 5-HT2A also. I've gone down some rabbit holes recently looking at dimerization, looking at how often, because, you know, we have this idea. I mean, first of all, the brain is way more complicated than I am explaining it or that I could ever understand it or that any of us could ever understand it. And that's like the beauty of the brain. It's like, if we could understand it, it wouldn't be very complicated and neither would we. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not as simple as, you know, this drug affects this receptor, period. First of all, most drugs are not, they're referred to as clean or dirty or promiscuous, which I love. So uh, all the good drugs are promiscuous. Like they hit more than one receptor. It's very rare that you have one drug that just goes to one receptor and that's the end of it, at least in terms of the drugs that you and I tend to talk about or that interest us. I do talk a lot about cannabis and good chemistry. Um, and the whole idea of good chemistry is that we naturally have all the great stash in our own brains. And there's all sorts of different ways to access it that, you know, you don't have to uh, trip or get high to have an increase in, you know, endocannabinoids or phenylethylamine. There's some line of good chemistry, which is like, you know, your brain is, is also a stash box. You know, you just have to know where to look. There are ways to make yourself feel high uh, without using drugs. All that being said, though, there's an awful lot of talk about drugs in this book because um, they interest me greatly. I like to try to explain sort of what I've figured out. And I, I do dumb down the science and there are people who are going to want more details. But the good news is there will be tons and tons and tons of references and notes and links to full articles on the website for the book. You're a psychiatrist. I am. Right? It's true. So you also, you know, within this American medical system, you know, a big part of a, the work of a psychiatrist is looking at, you know, pharmaceutical medications. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, especially when you have people coming in, clients, you know, who are on pharmaceutical medications, what's that relationship between maybe traditional SSRIs or SNRIs and how they affect neurochemistry compared to psychedelics and cannabis? Well, first of all, it gets really complicated to say too much about it definitively because there's absolutely no kind of, you know, double blind placebo controlled trials where they're looking at the interaction of prescription medicine and non-prescription medicine. So when I started out in the 90s, it was people who were very, very sick psychiatrically and didn't really know what to do. And I had to explain, oh, you know, there's medicines that can make you feel better and it's not so terrible, you know, and, and it doesn't make you a bad person. If you have to take it, it's just an antidepressant. And, you know, I would say something along the lines of, you know, you have a chemical imbalance and this will fix it. And, the, you know, 
I had to destigmatize and sort of uh, explain, oh, you have symptoms of, of depression and so you need these meds. And then 10 years later, you know, in the early 2000s, it, like there's no talk of that ever because everybody has heard about chemical imbalances and antidepressants. And so then it was people coming and saying, you know, I don't know if I should take Wellbutrin or Effexor. You know, my friend says that she, that, you know, Zoloft helps her. And my Pilates instructor was saying that, that Seroquel was good. And like, you know, it's like people had questions about meds and it wasn't a question of, I don't know what's wrong with me. Can you help me? It was like, which medicine should I take? But now I would say the patients that come to me, it's much more like I've been on these meds for many years. I tried this med and that med and this med. Nothing really helped me. I'm hearing about microdosing. I'm hearing about ketamine. I'm hearing about MDMA therapy or psilocybin therapy. Can you explain to me, do I have to get off these medicines? Can I stay on these medicines and still microdose? And so there's a few things that I do regularly. You know, If anybody wants to get off their medicines and I think that it will be okay, and that's a big if, but if I agree with that person that they want to be off their medicines because they want other options, then I will help them get off their medicines. Sometimes I'm like, oh, you, know, you off medicines is not going to go well, but there is a medicine that I can put you on that may work well for you and may allow you to do these other things. So I will say that there's a particular mood stabilizer that I use with my patients who want to explore alternative therapies that aren't legal. But then I would say that if they wanted to try ketamine, they don't have to get off their medicines. So I often will talk to people about just starting with ketamine because they don't have to change their meds and also they don't have to break the law, right? Because right now, unless you're going to sign up for a research program, you're going to go to somebody underground. So it's a really weird time to be a psychiatrist because a lot of the most promising therapies are still not legal. Um, and I'm not going to disparage ketamine because it really does help a lot of people, but it's not as good as some of the medicines that aren't yet FDA approved. So, you know, I'm, I'm involved in the MDMA PTSD trials. I was involved in the cannabis PTSD trials. They are over. I am not personally involved with the psilocybin trials, but I'm certainly uh, an enabler and a cheerleader um, of those studies. And everything is sort of moving along. And, and again, we could talk an hour about this issue of you know, medicalization versus uh, decriminalization. And I'm happy to, to entertain those questions a bit. But I will say that um, things are more or less moving in the right direction. And more people know that this is an option. And, and most importantly, more people are already benefiting from MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy whether it is happening in a research context or in an underground context. So it's a really great, exciting time to be a psychiatrist, I will say. And so from your perspective, what does it say about, you know, it's particularly the American medical establishment that they're starting to consider more and more these, you know, alternative substances like psilocybin, ketamine, MDMA compared to traditional pharmaceuticals? Well, it's, it's great. And I'm, you know, I would be lying if I didn't, if there weren't some part of me that was like, I fucking told you guys, <laughs> you know, like I have been saying this shit since the eighties, you know, like I, there's a little part of me that feels vindicated because I have been a little bit of a, you know, Johnny one note for, you know, 30 something years saying like, there's something here and people should look. So it, it's great, but that doesn't, necessarily have to disparage all psychiatric medication. I mean, you know, I feel obligated to give a bit of a caveat here that there are people with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. There are people who have serious, persistent, chronic, you know, severe symptoms that are going to need to stay on their meds. And they're, right now, it really wouldn't be prudent for those people to stop their meds for any reason or to stop their meds because they want to try psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or MDMA assisted psychotherapy. Like, you know, the research is showing that it's safe in these situations, you know, when people are properly prepared and there's a lot of uh, therapy beforehand and there's a lot of therapy between the sessions and everyone's carefully monitored. I'm one of the medical monitors for the multi-center trials and I was sometimes the medical monitor or one of the medical monitors for the earlier MDMA-assisted psychotherapy research. And it was important to me, it was totally my job and not just my job, to make sure that things were medically safe. You know, we've had an amazingly good run of medical safety and behavioral safety is a different issue. And I am also willing to talk about that. But I think that the 
mainstream psychiatry is certainly hearing about it. There's certainly, unless their you know head is under a rock or whatever, or head is in the sand. Like uh, I think they're they understand that these are becoming viable options. We've got more um, psychedelic research centers sort of cropping up. You know, Hopkins made a big one, and Imperial College made a big one, and there's absolutely something brewing at Mount Sinai as well. And Columbia is talking about creating one, and you know, we know there's there is a center at NYU. So these uh, centers are popping up. There's going to be more and more research. There's going to be uh, different indications where they're going to not just be looking at post-traumatic stress disorder, but they will start to look more at addiction. And, um, you know, there's already studies of like psilocybin and cocaine and psilocybin and nicotine addiction and psilocybin alcohol addiction. I think we'll continue to see more MDMA studies, not just PTSD, but people looking at uh, autism spectrum or eating disorders. There's so much. It's so rich because it's basically anything that would respond to really good, intense psychotherapy is going to respond to um, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy or MDMA assisted psychotherapy. So it's, you know, these are catalysts to make good therapy go deeper and go faster. And it comes back to what you were talking about before, which is, you know, this, this oxytocin, right. And, and how that leads to connection, which, you know, on the one hand is, is really great for people who maybe have had adverse childhood experiences, who need to have catharsis around those traumas, who need to feel like they are connected again, because it feels like, a lot of the trauma that, that we have as humans is related to disconnection, whether that's disconnection to self or family or the earth or community. And, um, and yet, as you mentioned, there can be you know, a dark side to that as well from a behavioral perspective in that when people are more suggestible in that state, it leads to issues of ethics. Right. So, you know, when I was putting together the ecstasy book back in uh, late 90s, and I was I was basically assigning everybody a chapter, you know, I was like, Dave Nichols, you do the chemistry. And, um, you know, and uh, I don't remember right now. But any, anyway, I signed chapters to different people. And I had assigned a chapter to a guy named Rick Ingrassi, who was one of the original early pioneers of MDMA therapy and ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And I heard back from a couple other people who I had assigned chapters to, because I didn't do anything blind, right? And they were like, oh, we're not going to be in this book if Rick and Grassi is in this book. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And that was one the first time that I learned that there had been any sort of impropriety and malevolent bad behavior around an assisted psychotherapy situation. Since that time, I have heard of a number of other instances. I, I will say a handful. I know that there are way more than that if I'm just hearing about a handful. But uh, it is absolutely clear that when any person is in an altered state, they are more vulnerable. And there has to be tremendous oversight in what happens in those sessions. You know, and I also think that there are situations where a person can have their own session and they don't necessarily need um, a sitter. Uh, You know, we certainly know about, and many of us have experienced, just having a psychedelic session on our own. And maybe you have a, a notebook and a pen and, you know, you're your own therapist. But that's not sort of traditionally the way it's done. And there are people who went way over the line and did things they absolutely should not have done, period. And in some cases, people have broken the law. In other cases, they haven't, but they've made terrible, terrible choices that have jeopardized the safety of the people they're working with and the sanctity of the work that they're doing. Um, not to mention uh, entire research projects. So it's a really big deal. I would love you to, you know, do just a whole podcast about, you know, shamans behaving badly, let's say. It could be a podcast series, Yeah, uh, you know, at this point. Well, you know? I mean, it certainly could be a documentary and I have sort of pitched things to documentarians as much as... Um, I am, you know, a fairy godmother and a and a cheerleader and a true believer in all of this work being done and everyone who needs it having access to these medicines. I also think that there can be a place for, you know, a critical eye and uh, you know, it's like a good parent. You don't just say like you're great, keep going and growing, you're doing great, Bobby. You know, like at some point you're like, um, <clears throat> Bad Bobby, except except that that other that things you don't don't do that. That's not good. Like that's part of being a good parent. Maybe you'd rather uh, discipline your kid in private, and and that's fine. But the disciplining has to be done, and the you know, and also just sometimes 
with a garden, you know, there's a lot of growth and then you have to prune, you know, and you have to cut the dead wood and you have to make some decisions about how big you want that plant to be. And you have to cut, you know, you have to prune the bush. And when I'm writing, you know, and I've written 160,000 words and it's got to be 120, like I have to dream 40,000 words. You got to kill your darlings. You know, that's part of making art is you got to pull back. And it's like, unrestricted growth is what got us into a lot of problems in America with capitalism. And, you know, in, in medicine, unrestricted growth equals cancer. So you can't have unrestricted growth. You need pruning and shaping and disciplining. Um, and it's all, you know, maybe it's like in its adolescence. And so it's like testing limits. So, you know, an adolescent needs to know where the limits are. They, you know, they want to know that they can't get away with everything and that they're not in charge. So, this is a great analogy. I'm glad that's I, I, coming I through. This. You explain things so well. So <laughs> what, you know, it's like a follow-up to that. If we're in this, let's say, adolescent stage specific to, you know, the, the psychedelic movement, if you will. And I think we're also in an adolescent stage as a culture still. People yeah. will make that case as well. You know, there's there's many fractals of this analogy. But, but specific to the psychedelic space, like, what have you witnessed or what have, what, what are you aware of in terms of like, guidelines being put into place you know and i think this is where we get a little well i like, think tricky between medicalization and decriminalization yeah. you know like balancing well, there's a, those there's a few well. guidelines that i that i look to there's a few people that i've been looking to for for guides of sort like um you know i i've known bob jesse for like i don't know 20 something 30 something years a real like you know practically before the internet <laughs> like i've been in touch with him you know when i I had a really, really early email address and, uh, he was, he was one of the first people sort of in my list. So I would say, anyway, I trust, uh, you know, when Bob Jesse writes something and wants a bunch of people to sign on, I sign on, um, the, you know, the open science sort of manifesto, I think is one good place to start. I also think that, um, Annie Oak and women's visionary Congress is she's somebody I've known forever. And I absolutely trust her ethics and, um, they have a lot to say. WVC has a lot to say about these sort of uh, egregious behaviors. And then I also, uh, Bia Labache is somebody I've known for decades and I, and Chakruna has some very clear guidelines and they've spent a lot of time really thinking about this. And then there's maps and then there's Rick and I've known Rick for 30 something years. And I don't know what I could possibly say about Rick that I haven't already said on some other interview or podcast, but here's what I often say about Rick is I have this very clear visual of him and he is like, and I do not mean this in a bad way at all because I love Rick and I've, I see, I've known him like, you know, longer than I know my husband, like a really long time. And, uh, since, you know, 85, um, and which is when maps started. Yeah. Pretty. I knew him before maps, a little before maps. So I was, I was, I, I consider, I call myself a charter member if there is such a thing, because I was, I was in pretty <laughs> early, but, um, but the, the, the metaphor I always give for Rick is I think of like this, it's like a, a three-year-old on a tricycle with a helmet and they keep ramming into this brick wall over and over and over. And the brick wall, like very, very slowly crumbles. And like that to me is Rick where it's just like, he's been like, battering he's been like a battering ram against the dea and you know for mdma and just been sort of single-minded and trying to get uh mdma into the hands of people who need it for so 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 long and i've just watched him um keep at it and and in the process he's sort of he's created a company you know this like behind every great man is a great woman or whatever it's like behind rick is like a bunch of great fucking women a bunch of amazing women and like you know uh they are getting it done and there's it's you would not believe how much work it is the the multi-center trial the phase three you know it's like it's so much paperwork it's so much ridiculous bureaucratic uh you know conference calls and zoom meetings and like just stupid crossing every t and dotting every i like i can't, cannot impress upon you the bureaucracy and bullshit that it takes to actually make this happen um and they're doing it they're making it happen you know and i really i have a lot of respect for what's happening but the jensen thing is really bad and mm -hmm. i was hoping that it wouldn't bring down the whole sort of house of cards and uh i believe 
didn't and it won't. And uh, whether it should or shouldn't, I'm, I don't, I don't want to say, cause I think that's like a rude thing to say. And I absolutely, um, really, you know, respect all the players and I understand that people were absolutely, um, psychically injured from what happened. Um, also, you know, I've, I've known Donna and Richard a really long time. Like, you know, you're, I'm 54 and I've been in this community since 85. So, um, you know, I know all the players <laughs> and like, it's important to me to know all the players. And, um, you know, I was pretty freaked out when I heard what happened. And, uh, ev- a lot of people were really freaked out when they heard what happened. Um, and I am just sort of uh, part of me, uh, and I, maybe this is like a callous part of me, but part of me is just kind of like, keep your head down, keep going, get the data. We, you know, like we mm. are in the middle of this huge multi-center trial. And if we can get the data to prove what we all know, um, then we will have, you know, we will really have gifted the, the earth, something great for it to heal. And like, you know, you think there's PTSD now and like from 9-11, like wait till you see the PTSD fallout from this. Like the, you know, I mean, I have got plenty of friends who are doctors and nurses who are in the thick of it and they're going to need a little help processing this when all is said and done. So, you know, unfortunately we are creating sort of more PTSD as we go, not less. So my heart absolutely goes out to the person who was 100%, you know, wronged by this experience. And I, and my heart goes out to many other women who have been completely taken advantage of and victimized when they were in a vulnerable state, because I know it happens. And I, I've had patients come to me and tell me terrible things that happened to them at, at music festivals and parties. And, um, I mean, I've also had, had men, you know, with methamphetamine and uh, who have been raped and you know and then there's uh our great president who is a huge traumatizer who for my patients who have been sexually abused or assaulted trump is so triggering because he is such a predator you know i just remember the way he was sort of like pacing around hillary during the during the debate but but he really he's he's a bully and a traumatizer and the whole kind of kavanaugh trial and you know whether Lazy Ford was being believed or not. Like that was really hard on, on me and on my patients and on like every woman who's been in that position of being victimized and, you know, having to come forward and not being believed. And I, I absolutely believe that a lot of the people who have been victimized in these either ayahuasca circles or, you know, individual sessions with toad or with MDMA therapy, I think, uh, not, clearly not everybody who has been victimized has come forward. And there's a lot of people who, haven't for many reasons. I guess I personally would at least like to hear from more people about their experiences um, because not everybody talks to me about it. And um, it's important to me that I know sort of what's going on where. Do you mean with your patients or do you mean just generally no, speaking? My, like people can be more open about um, it. Well, my patients certainly come to me and tell me what happened. But, you know, I do think that there are that there are people who are afraid to come forward with what has happened to them because of reprisals or reprisals or because maybe they also are afraid that they don't necessarily want to you know bring the research down or stop the medicine from um, getting where it needs to go but then on the other hand there's this whole other faction of people who really reject the medical model and just you know uh, I can grow mushrooms I can grow cannabis what why do I need anybody else you know these are plants you know, I love the decriminalized nature platform mm-hmm. and people and the whole idea of it. And I, you know, yes, of course, of course, I should be able to grow whatever plants I want in my garden. I should be able to grow poppies and mushrooms and cannabis and, you know, their plants. I live on the earth. I'm entitled to have a garden and I can ingest whatever I want. And, you know, there's cognitive liberty or there should be, you know, we should be allowed to ingest whatever we want. But, you know, Unfortunately, we're not there yet as a society. And so people are just sort of trying to work within the parameters that they have. And also, you can't grow your own MDMA, you know? Sassafras. Yeah, well, but, but you know, then the issue with sassafras or nutmeg is that you, uh, you vomit if you ingest enough to really give you um, sort of psychological effects. But 
there are other ways to increase oxytocin, which do feel pretty well, good, but they just don't, they don't last as long. <laughs> That's the problem. Well, let's go into that because, because I feel like, you know, my own personal experience with psychedelics, I've been doing them for 10 years now. So I'm 29 now. When I was 19 is when I first started working with LSD and psilocybin at higher dose levels. I would say the core insight from that was because I'm so interconnected with everything around me that it's really important that I know where my food comes from and that it's really important that I understand, you know, like who my friends are and what their energy is. Like, yeah. And that it's really important that I take good care of myself. And what, you know, something we teach through our microdosing course in particular is look, you know, psychedelics, MDMA, cannabis, anything that you're using sort of as a catalyst for healing, it's not a magic pill sort of formulation because that's sort of been the assumption that's been integrated into the American medical system. Yeah. You take this, you'll be fixed, you know, blah, 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 blah. A lot of this has to do with lifestyle changes, you know, like changing how we eat and changing the sleep, our sleep patterns and changing who we interact with. So from your research and what you've gone into, what are, we can call them complementary practices that people can, you know, integrate to have more oxytocin and more serotonin and to be more connected beyond just, you know, having an MDMA experience. Right. Well, so, you know, one of the things I wrote about quite a bit in Good Chemistry is how, you know, the best thing you can do for oxytocin is be skin to skin, face to face, eye to eye, smelling each other's pheromones, cuddling naked, like that's going to give you a lot of oxytocin. So the problem right now with a little social distancing is that becomes very tricky. Um, there are other states which are very high oxytocin states like nursing and childbirth, which are not going to be available to everyone, but uh, some of us are going to really experience the joys of nursing, and that's a pretty high oxytocin state. And if you have natural childbirth, that's a very high oxytocin state. But then there's just orgasm, which you know, hopefully most of us have have access to. And again, that's why I was joking. It doesn't last very long, right? Like if with MDMA, you have these high oxytocin levels that go on for you know, maybe an hour or two hours at the, at the peak of it. Um, I understand the MDMA experience goes on longer, but I don't think that the whole time you're having an MDMA experience, you're having these peak oxytocin levels, but sting aside, I think most of us can't have these sustained, uh, orgasms. So then we're just going to get little, little bursts of oxytocin. For instance, um, if I, if I hold a baby, I'm not nursing anymore, obviously, but even if I just like hold my friend's baby, you know, and like smell the baby's head and just kind of hold a baby and like get, feel, uh, feel love and uh, compassion and, and the sense that I want to protect the baby that will give me an oxytocin increase. Um, and I can feel it because I've been paying attention to this for a really long time. And like, you know, babies make me feel a certain way. But the other, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, on a FaceTime call with a friend of mine who this baby I'm very close to. And she just put the phone down so I could just watch the baby for a while. And I'm watching the baby through, you know, my tiny little phone. And I am starting to feel that thing that I feel, you know, like, I'm like, Oh, mm -hmm. I really, you know, I, I am almost sure really that just looking at the baby through the screen, I am having a tiny little bit of an oxytocin hit from that. I don't know. Like I all of a sudden just got that, like, huh. <sighs> You know, so, so maybe we can, you know, maybe we can through our phones and through our, you know, zoom contacts or whatever, maybe we can sort of still tiny bit feel that, that connection. But, you know, the book that I wrote was totally before coronavirus. And, and I made the case in the book that we cannot, that the, right. that, that our phones or the laptops, like that is synthetic tapping a heart, you know, on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, you know, is not the same as touching hearts, you know, <laughs> like it's not really going to open up your heart, you know? And I have this idea that when it, because it's synthetic, you go for quantity instead of quality, right? There's this great quote. Exactly. I love this quote, which is like, you, you can never get enough of something that almost works. Right. So, mm. you know, you're, you're pressing like, and you're scrolling and you're scrolling and it's almost enough, but it's like, if it were enough, you would stop, <laughs> you know, it's not enough. And so, you, you know, you're sort of insatiable to have this little synthetic connection because it's better than nothing. And it is better than nothing, but it's also not, you know, it's scratching around an itch. It's not quite the real thing. There was a book I read by Cal Newport recently. I think it's called Digital Minimalism. Mm -hmm. In that book, he made the case where it's like tapping hearts on Instagram or liking things on Twitter. In fact, it has an overall a negative consequence because you feel as if you're connecting with others. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you're actually not. And it's right. sort of like like the analogy that's come up for me, it's like fast food. Yeah. You're eating food, 
when you eat fast food, but it's, and it kind of feels like you're full, but at the end of the day, it's really just poison. Right. It's not nutritional, right? It doesn't really like, it doesn't feed your soul, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, But on the other hand, it's like right now it's better than nothing. And, you know, it is the thing that's sort of, I mean, it's like the drug that's just sort of, you know, soothing us until we can get out and get the real thing. It's like, we are going to have to just deal with a synthetic version for now. Although, you know, many of us, many of us who are like quarantining with our family or, you know, in some sort of a pod, um, you still are having that, you know, human contact. Um, and you know, one, the way that I, that I wrote good, good chemistry, I sort of divided each chapter where I talked about feeling connected and feeling a sense of oneness. First of all, just with yourself, you know, being embodied, and maybe uh, being mindful, like just being connected with yourself, it can be a high oxytocin state where you feel relaxed and you're breathing through your nose um, and you're in parasympathetic. And that, that is enough for you to feel like you belong and you're connected just in your body with yourself. And so that was the first chapter. And then the second chapter is connecting with a partner. Um, and I talk about sort of opposites attracting and then repelling because that's sort of what happens in relationships you know you you find somebody who has all these things that you don't and then it's like you complete me but then you know you start fighting because the reason you don't have those things is that they were they were sort of beaten out of you uh so to speak Mm -hmm. um and you you learn that they were bad and so you end up sort of projecting all you know all that negativity onto your partner who has those things even though those are the things that you said completed you and uh there's also this this idea of rivalries um, where people who are more alike than different end up feeling like they're opposites, but everybody else thinks that they're not. Anyway, that's the chapter. So, so first chapter is connecting with self. Second is with a partner. Third is connecting with a family. And that's where, I, you know, I talk about sort of the science of nursing and, and childbirth and oxytocin, but I also talk about like how fucking hard it is to be with your family, you know, like how incredibly challenging it is and how they push all your buttons and how, you know, there's just, it's just like triggers everywhere, you know? And, um, and that's why I'm like so pleasantly surprised at how well the four of us are getting along here on our interminable snow day, because I was worried about that. And then the fourth chapter is about connecting with society and, and community. And that's where I talk a lot about politics and the science of politics and this sort of, you know, lefty, righty in terms of the of the parasympathetic versus sympathetic and these open and closed states and how, you know, because the dirty little secret about oxytocin, it's like, yes, it's about bonding and trust and blah, blah, blah. But also it's totally about, are you on my team or are you on the other team? I talk a lot about how sort of us and them and that sort of mentality is also fueled by oxytocin and how that kind of xenophobia goes into politics. So I try to talk about sort of oxytocin and politics and the science of connection versus disconnection in terms of, you know, red state, blue state or liberal or conservative, those kind of labels. Um, and then the, then I talk about the connection with nature and the connection with earth and the cosmos and death. So the last chapter is really a lot more about psychedelics and about, you know, this idea that everything is connected and we're all connected. Um, and I, it, I really, honestly, I wanted to do a whole book about death, but my agent was just like, yeah, no, <laughs> but it's like, nobody wants that. But, the, but I, you know, honestly, I think, you know, it's, there's a few blind spots in medicine. And one of the biggest blind spots in medicine is, is around how we deal with dying people. And um, I mean, you know, they're getting a crash course now and how, and how to deal with dying people like never before, but, you know, and now we can't do any sort of our usual rituals or rites around burial and, and grief, which is really going to fuck up a lot of people because it's nice when you lose somebody and everybody comes together and they support you and they talk about how great that person was and what they meant to them. And there's this closure and, you know, none of us are having any of the rituals around grief right now. And I would say that we are all in a state of grief. First of all, even before this virus, many of us were in a state of grief about our planet and about the state of our country. And, you know, this is just like trauma and grief on top of trauma and grief. And it's a lot for people to take. Why is it that death is so taboo? And why, why is it that we don't have, you know, a, a good relationship to it? Here? Well, I think, first of all, you're, you know, we are kind of programmed to, to have a lot of anxiety around not existing anymore. And, and I think, you know, it's funny because, you know, you and I are like, why? What? Like, what's the big deal? Death? Who cares? You know, because it's like, yeah, I had five grams of mushrooms when I was 20 something. And I was like, 
yeah, yeah death is cool. <laughs> you know, like I, I went to a place where I didn't exist and it was fabulous. <laughs> but I think the average person walking around, like they just, they haven't had that. You know, they don't know uh, that, you know, letting go and not existing anymore and that there's something bigger that will absorb you, you know, or like there's, you know, there's a interconnected lattice work of light and energy around everything. And you'll just become one with that. Like, you know, if you start talking that way to the average person, it's not going to go well, you know, they may bring you into Bellevue, but then luckily maybe I'll be there to make sure you don't really belong there. So it's crazy talk, right? But like the people who've had mystical experiences, who've had ego disintegration, who, you know, who've quieted their default mode network, they've had these really blissful experiences of not existing and of everything being connected. And it's possible that they are less afraid of death and less afraid to talk about it and, and deal with the reality of it. But like, you know, the average, you know, whatever, Joe six pack on the street, like, you know, they're not there. They're, they're not in that place. And so, and the, the easiest defense, you know, and the one used by toddlers, but the one like I used in 2016 is denial. Just like, no, we didn't. No, he's not. No, this isn't happening. You know, I was like, I was amazed how much I used all my brain power and energy for months after the election to just be like, no, he didn't. No, he isn't. No, it's not. Because like, I had to, you know, I, would, I, I wouldn't have been able to get out of bed. You know, so I think like we use denial a lot and certainly we use it with death all the time. And, you know, the thing about COVID-19 is it's not going to let you be in a state of denial about death anymore. We're all uh, equally on the chopping block. So and we need to have these talks. You know, we we've we need as as our population um, ages, we are going to have to have the hard talks about, you know, quality of life and health span versus lifespan. And there are some people who would say we can have both, you know, like the, the, you know, longevity people. In fact, this is what I'm really interested in. You know, we talk about even with what's going on with COVID right now, there are certain things that people can do to improve the immune system, which is why it's looking like it affects, you know, it affects mostly elderly people, although it also affects people in their twenties and thirties as well, but, but mostly elderly. And so there, there is this element now with, with all the knowledge and information that we have, where if someone wants to live a, a long lifespan and a really healthy lifespan, it's possible now more than ever. I think the tricky thing for a lot of people is how do you separate the signal from the noise? Because there's so much information that it can be overwhelming to figure out, well, what's true and what's not. Yeah. So, well, I will sort of quickly address that and then we may have to wrap up. But, you know, I'm, I mean, I, you know... I voraciously read nonfiction books. And so, you know, like Dave Asprey's books or things like that, like people who are trying to game, game the system on longevity, it really all keeps coming back to a few basic ideas. But one, one idea that I will, you know, remind you of that we talked about earlier is this idea of being in parasympathetic more, right? That when you're in parasympathetic, your immune system works better, your digestion works better, your metabolism works better. And it is the only time where your body initiates the repair protocols that it has access to that, you know, the body can repair itself a bit here and there. It does not do any repair when you are in fight or flight. So anything you can do to get into parasympathetic will help you not only feel calmer, but you will be healthier and live longer. It will put you more in this sort of anti-inflammatory state, you know? So like for my patients, I encourage them to do anything that's anti-inflammatory, right? So stress is inflammatory, right? So anything that decreases stress is anti-inflammatory. So that includes things like go outside in the woods, go to the ocean, uh, breathe through your nose, take a yoga class, meditate, just do nothing for five minutes. You don't have to meditate. Just fucking sit down without your phone for five minutes. You Maybe if you breathe through your nose, you'll be in parasympathetic. It's already good. You know, sleep is good. Being held being soothed, cuddling, that is all great for parasympathetic, playing with a baby, playing with a puppy. Uh, any, any interaction pretty much with your pets seems to really help put you in parasympathetic. Um, floating, if you have the luxury of a hot tub or a lake um, or an isolation flotation device, like floating can put you in para. But really just breathing through your nose and you know thinking calming thoughts is enough to help your body be in a place where it can take advantage of, of the food you're eating and really digest it well and help your metabolism and help your immune system and help the 
the bodily repair that needs to go on. So it's a sort of anti-inflammatory state. And the other thing I will say is that cannabis um, has got potent anti-inflammatory properties. And for many people, it helps to put you in a mindful state where you feel connected with your body um, or you feel connected with nature or you feel more in touch with the music that you're playing or singing. And like those are all sort of enhancing parasympathetic states. So if you smoke too much and you get paranoid or upset or agitated or anxious, then no, for you, it was not a parasympathetic state. But uh, for many other people, it is part of an anti-inflammatory lifestyle and it does help to keep you in parasympathetic. Beautiful. Everything in moderation, as they say. So Dr. Julie Holland, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast before, you know, as, as a final wrap up, if you could just the name of your book that's coming out and just if people want to find out more information about your work, like a website or, you know, a place they can check it out. Sure. So um, the book that's coming out in June is called Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And um, my website, I, there's so many ways to reach it. It's like uh, Dr. Holland, thepotbook.com, naturalmood.com, moodybitches.com. It all brings you to the same place. Cool. And if you, I mean, if you just Google like Julie Ecstasy, you'll find me. When I, I used to meet people at parties back in the 90s and I'd be like, just Google Julie Ecstasy, you'll find me. So that still works, which I love. So you'll find me if anybody feels like pre-ordering this book. I think it's it. I am preaching to the choir, I know, with your podcast audience, but this, I think people will really like this book. I featured a lot of women in this book because I, I love Michael Pollan. You know, there's so many men in the psychedelic community and, and they're lovely and I love them, but I want to sort of feature some of the women in the psychedelic community a little bit more in this book. So you may notice a bit more gender parity than you're used to in good chemistry. Beautiful. Well, thanks again so much. All right. My pleasure, Paul. Paul.